All right, I'm going to go ahead and send the feed your way. We'll get about 20 seconds till the open. Have a good show. Thank you very much. Here in live internet talk radio, visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. If you're a dog owner, safety and welfare for your pet is of utmost concern. But there are so many so-called experts out there that many of us don't know where to turn to to get the expert advice that we need. Welcome to Taming the Wild in Your Dog with noted dog expert and author Brian Bailey. In this program, we give you the tips you need to connect with your best friend with the most practical advice. Now, here is your host, Brian Bailey. Welcome to Taming the Wild and Your Dog. Hey guys, I'm your host, Brian Bailey, and joining me in the studio today is my lovely wife, Kira. Hello, everyone. I hope she, are those, is the uh, duct tape binding that I have on you a little bit too tight? (laughs) I'll try to loosen it up. (laughs) All right. Also joining me in the studio today is professional dog trainer extraordinaire, Joshua Huffmaster. Say hello, Joshua. Hello, how's it going? Good afternoon. All right. Hey, guys, we're really excited about this show. This is our inaugural show, Taming the Wild and Your Dog. And why am I so excited? Uh, I'm very passionate about what I do, but I'm really excited about this show because you know why? It's your show. That's right. It's your show. If you are a dog owner, dog lover, you're thinking about even getting a dog. If you are a dog professional, maybe you're a veterinarian, maybe you're a groomer, maybe you own a boarding kennel or day, daycare facility, or you're a fellow professional trainer, this show is for you. And why is this show for you? Because the reason why is this? Yeah, I get it. We all love dogs. I do. Care. We own four dogs. Uh, I can't imagine a day in my life without owning a dog. I really, really can't. However, dogs come with their own issues. They really do. It's not all about rainbows and unicorns. They come with issues. Dogs bite people. They bite other dogs. Puppies aren't naturally housebroken. Dogs don't naturally come when called. At least none of mine did. Uh, Not a lot of my clients as well. But dogs do naturally jump on us. And they do naturally chase cats. And they also have a tendency to pull their owners when they try to walk them until they've been trained. And this list goes on and on and on. There are problems associated with owning dogs. The problem with that is that when you turn to other professionals or your family or your friends or the internet for suggestions and tips or advice on how to deal with your problem, you get a bigger one. You even get a a larger headache because the amount of information, especially misinformation that's available today on the internet on YouTube, family and friends is overwhelming. And, and it's reached a point where it's actually creating a, a, a dangerous condition. Uh, I've written about it in my books. So you, you need good, factual, accurate, honest information to help you with your problems. Uh, just to give you an example of some of the misguided or the misinformed information that's out there, Uh, I recently looked up a question that was asked on a dog trainer's Facebook group page. And and then I won't name it. This was a while ago. And the owner or the the person that posted it wrote this question. My dog yanks me down the street. Can anyone help me? Now, what I did here was take a compilation of many of the answers that were provided to this person. So when you put them all together, kind of like putting a little puzzle together, This is what it sounds like. When considering your approach to curbing your dog's desire to pull, you must first consider what harmful effect environmental stimuli may have had on the socio-effective centers of the right hemisphere of your dog's brain. After all, this is the area of the brain responsible for regulating stress. Oh, and by the way, just so you know, having having to drag you down the street is very stressful for your dog and can actually lead to a post-traumatic stress encounter or condition. And if this wasn't bad enough, to prevent this from happening while teaching your dog to stop pulling you, you will have, at the same time, have to apply the law of effect by shaping your dog's behavior with the use of positive 
and negative reinforcers, along with positive and negative punishment that take advantage of ratio schedule. All the while, remaining alert for the development of the partial reinforcement extinction effect. And if all that fails, well, then just bribe the damn dog with a treat. So there you go. So when you have that coming at you as an answer, good luck trying to discern from that what you're supposed to do. But that's what happens. And by the time it took me to read that, there were more than likely 500,243 Google searches and 1 million 184,390 YouTube videos played. Welcome to our new world. Everything that you want to know, you can look it up on a video or you can Google it. But what that does for us is provide some amount of conceptual knowledge, but it doesn't provide the experiential knowledge that is so vital for learning about your dog's behavior and then trying to modify your dog's behavior. I learned a long time ago that as a child growing up in Alaska, that keeping it simple kept me alive. And I've applied that to the science of dog behavior, behavior modification, whenever I evaluate dogs to determine if they suffer from mental disorders, or if I'm just trying to help a friend or a client or a family member. Simplicity leads to action. And action is what we need to start taking in this country. We really do. 700,000 plus dogs per year are euthanized for behavioral reasons. Behavioral. We have all these rescues. We have all these shelters. We have thousands and thousands upon magnets that say who rescued who. But yet, we have animals that are out of control. Sometimes I just want to scream out there as I walk by someone and their dog lunges at me and, and grabs me by the pants legs. I would just want to say, hey, I don't deserve your dog. This show, I really do hope, will provide you with accurate answers, honest answers. And in the course of providing those, you may not get the answer you want. But I do promise you, you'll get the answer you need. So along with answering questions, because this is going to be an interactive show, we actually demand that you interact. In fact, I'm going to say heal. And when you hear the word heal, that means you need to pay attention and you need to come up with a question and interact, because that's really what we want on this show. We don't want just listeners. Dog world, dog community, or an action community. And I just told you, we're going to go into action. So I really want you guys to, to think about that. Also, we'll be providing a lot of commentary, a lot of insight. And then we're going to be interviewing guests that are what we consider to be experts in the field. And in the field I speak of is multi-layered. There'll be experts on canine nutrition. Good Lord, we all need that. Just walk into a pet store. And next thing you know, you're trying to decide GMOs or no GMOs, grain-free or not grain-free. Uh, how much preservatives are in this bag of food? Should my dog eat fish? Maybe poultry. I heard a lot of dogs are now becoming a little bit uh, allergic to poultry. It's really confusing. So we hope to be able to clear that up on the show by inviting canine nutritionist, uh, geneticist, talk about our dogs. Where did they come from? Well, we all know that they came from wolves. And if you don't know, you're going to definitely know after the end of this show. What has happened to all the breeding, all this crazy craziness where all of a sudden, I can remember even 20, 25 years ago, I'd never heard of a doodle. But now there's doodles, everything. We're going to have experts in behavior. Authors, noted authors, really excited. So in other words, guys, if you love dogs, this is not, I promise you, this is not going to be your typical fluffy dog show. We will have moments that will break your heart, but also moments in which, hey, 
I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to put it out to you straight. Because anyone that knows Brian knows that's what he does. So I'm proud to be your host. And I, I thank Voice America. And I thank our producer, Robert Salino, uh, Ryan Treasure, who's an incredible technical guy and plus uh, an ex-Navy man like me. Um, Jeff um, Girdle, Girdle, I think is his last name. Did I say it correctly? I'm Jeff, oh my sure God, if I butchered your last name, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that's why I'm, I'm excited. Kara, why are you excited? Why are you, why are you excited for the show? Well, gosh, there are so many reasons that I'm excited, but I would say if I had to narrow it down to just a couple, you know, this has been a dream of yours for so long. And when you get to witness someone that you love realizing their dream, gosh, there's just not a better day than that. That's an incredible day. And also to get our message out there. And we've been wanting a bigger platform to really push our message out there. And I'm so excited for this platform and to be able to do that for people to hear our message. So those are my two biggest reasons. All right. Well, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, you probably notice I'm blushing just a little bit right now. So thank you for those kind words. Joshua. All right. So Joshua, tell us, why are you excited about the show? Well, like you were saying earlier, all the information that's out there, um, I, I was a victim to that when I first started, you know, trying to find good information that I could apply practically in the field was really hard to come by because the inconsistency in which that I would apply certain things that I saw didn't really mesh together when you would apply different concepts in, in different areas of training. Um, but one of the biggest reasons that uh, I, I, I think that this show is really going to be important is sorry, backtrack a little bit. The first thing that I saw when I came into Taming the Wild was a, was a quote by you and Kira on the board that said, you're not just training a dog, you're potentially saving its life. And that really resonated with me because all of the information that's out there that, that could be potentially wrong or incorrect or inconsistent, that's threatening dogs' lives. And, and finding a place in which that, that is consistent information that could potentially save the dog's life, I mean, you couldn't do better work in, in this industry. So having that platform is amazing. It is. Thank you for that, Joshua. I really appreciate that. Um, the safety, and when we talk about saving lives, that's really open-ended. When you take a dog into your life, it's not always just about saving the dog. It's about how the dog saves you. But one thing that I have learned is the glue that holds that together, the glue is behavior. In other words, I write all the time. The last time I looked, the dog was in my want category. I wanted a dog. And we all want dogs for various reasons. We want a companion. Some of us need dogs, not just because we have a disability, but because we just need a little help in our lives. And dogs provide that. They're four-legged salvation. They're incredible. But one thing I have definitely learned, sometimes they're not salvation. The very animal that was supposed to lower your blood pressure now raises it. The animal that you brought in your household to be your children's guardian, your child's big brother or big sister, suddenly turns on to them. I've interviewed parents who just recently buried their three-year-old. Behavior is important. And like Joshua said, it's the correct information, accurate information that counts the most. And just to give you another example before we get ready to take a short break here in just a second. I had a lady who just came to see me not too long ago. And the advice that she was given was this. Her dog was growling anytime she walked into her kitchen where the dog was eating. And this was a two-year-old dog. She was worried about this. But before she contacted me, she visited her local pet store. And while there, she was told, all you need to do is simply put your hands in the food. Put your scent all over it. 
then your dog will know that you prepared its food and it would be forever grateful and never growl at you and certainly never try to bite you. Well, of course, I asked my client, I go, well, how'd that work out for you? And she points to a bandage on her face and goes, I got bitten. And there you have it. And, and I could make up an entire shows relating one story after another. It's one thing when you get advice and your dog continues to just pull you, or you receive bad advice and your dog continues to bark. It's a whole nother when you get bad advice and it leads to an injury and to even worse, a fatality. This show is about everything from harmless. Hey, why does my dog jump on me? Hey, Brian, can you give me a tip or two? You bet I can. Why does my dog bark at everything? I only want my dog to bark at the person coming up to my door. Yeah, we can cover that too. But then all of a sudden you may write, Brian, why is my dog so afraid of thunderstorms? And then we talk a little bit deeper about that, about how 20% of all dogs are suffering from mental disorders. And we talk about how to solve that, how to ensure a higher quality of life for both you and your dog. So welcome to taming the wild in your dog. In just a minute, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we, people ask us all the time, what does it mean to tame the wild in your dog? What is that? So we'll be going over that. But before we go, I want to tell you that we will not be answering questions on today's show, but we certainly will on all the rest of the shows that we have. And to send in a question to us, you can either A, on our next show, which will be aired at the same time next week at noon central time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, you can call in at 866-472-5788. Now put that in your speed dial, 866-472-5788. Or send me an email. Love to get an email from you. And you can send that to Brian, and that's Brian with a Y, B-R-Y-A-N, at tamingthewild.com. Again, Brian with a Y at tamingthewild.com. Love to hear from you guys. Send in those questions. Give us a call next week, uh, but also stay tuned because we're going to be talking about what does it mean to tame the wild and your dog. All right, guys, we're going to cut away to a short break. And in the meantime, sit, stay. See you back in a few minutes. All right, perfect. Great job. We're all clear. Back in a couple minutes.
Yeah, yeah, you guys were clear. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, hello, testing one, two, three. Hello, hello. Mm, not good, not good. Oh, oh now I can. Okay. Oh, you can hear me now? Oh. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, we've been clear. <laughs> the, the, okay. The, the break, <laughs> uh, it's just about over here. We're going to be coming back in about 10 seconds. Okay. The leader in internet talk radio, voiceamerica.com. You are listening to Taming the Wild and Your Dog. To reach the program today, please call 1 866 472 5788. Again, that's 1 866 472 5788. You can also send an email if you prefer to brian at tamingthewild.com. Now back to the show. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Brian Bailey. I'm your host of Taming the Wild and Your Dog. Joining me in the studio today is my lovely wife, Kira, and also we have professional dog trainer, Joshua Huffmaster. Now, before we went on a break, we were talking about why we were so excited to be on the show. Now let's talk a little bit about what does it mean to tame the wild in your dog? Well, I think to answer that question, first of all, we need to start off with a little bit about my background because that's how it all came to be. I was raised in Fairbanks, Alaska, back in a time in which it was very unsettled. Not that that's settled now, but wolves and other animals that populated the forest there and around where we lived were not as uh, trying to avoid mankind as, as much as they are today. It was very easy for me to observe them, and I did so almost on a daily basis. And we also had sled dogs. So it didn't take long before I was able to observe the behavior of a wolf and notice that the behavior of my dog was incredibly similar. And that's how the, the flame was ignited. That was the first glowing ember. But then after that, I served our country in the United States Navy, and I was a part of an elite uh, program in which we trained marine mammals. I trained sea lions, a project called Quick Find, and then I was a, a member of two other projects that involved dolphins, one known as Short Time, the other one is Bottom Look. So that allowed me to expand my horizon even more. And then in between all of that, I took up dog training, uh, more as a hobby, that led me into competition. And soon I was competing in Schutzen, which is a competition that requires three major behaviors from the animal, obedience, tracking, and then protection work or bite work. Uh, and ring sport is very similar, just take away the, the tracking portion with some changes in there. I was also showing dogs in AKC. And it was at some point in the early 80s, I had other competitors approach me and asked me if I could help them with their dogs. And they were willing to pay for it. And there we go. So that got everything rolling in the, in the direction of uh, being a professional dog trainer. But all throughout that time period, I was making many excursions back to Alaska, back to Canada, to the Northwest America, doing work, doing some work for US Fish and Wildlife and other agencies to do observations, study wolves, study their behaviors, report findings back. Uh, ever since then, my passion for dog training has grown. But more importantly, the observation that I was able to take to observe wildlife, wolves in particular, other animals, even over in Africa, lions, East African hunting dogs, hyenas, study marine mammals, dolphins, sea lions, and you start to pick up on a common thread that they all have, social predatory threads. You have animals who live in social groups, and yet they hunt for their living. And those of you who own dogs, who chase squirrels, chase your cat, chase 
people. <laughs> you start to get a feel for, wow, I think I might have a little bit of a wolf in my dog. Well, guess what, guys, you do. Because at a funda level, at a fundamental level, it means that when you tame the wild in your dog, you keep with nature's plan. You don't use mankind's plan. You go by nature's plan. You take into the account that dogs did evolve from wolves. You recognize that fact, that they still share a biological and behavioral connection with wolves. And guys, this is indisputable. This isn't just my opinion based upon my own personal observation. This is recognized by biologists, taxidermists, ethologists, geneticists. In other words, if you have an ist on the end of your name, you probably agree to it. In fact, dogs still share 99.8% of their mitochondrial DNA. And if you've ever studied biology or studied behavior and then talked to someone who studied biology, you'll find out very quickly that the two are inseparable. They're as intertwined as gravity, atmosphere, everything that, that we require to remain alive on the planet Earth. Dogs still share an incredible connection with wolves. There are many behaviors that are very common to a dog that are common to a wolf. We call those global specific behaviors. Now, how did this come to be? There are many hypotheses to it, but I think the one that is the most logical is that approximately, and again, there's, this is where data can vary, but we approach it with an open mind. That approximately 40,000 years ago, the dog and the wolf were one creature. So now I'm going to ask you to use your imagination. And you're looking at a tree with two branches. Well, as this animal moves further up the trunk of that tree, at some point, some of them came in contact with what we believe to be mobile hunting groups. In other words, furless bipeds. And no doubt that both the furless bipeds and the wolves or the wolf-like creature mutually benefit from their encounter. More than likely at that time we had weapons and weapons allowed us to kill larger animals than what we could really eat. And therefore for these wolf creatures, hey, it's a free meal. Sure does beat having to make physical contact with another animal with sharp hooves, antlers, teeth. Yeah, they're learned, they're smart animals. And that continued for a long time until mankind finally took up agriculture and trade. And then at that point there, this wolf-like creature that, has, that had already started to change was invited into dwellings, invited to do family activities, but also to now serve mankind, to be animals of labor or to herd sheep, pull heavy sleds. They entered our dwellings. You know, and proof of that is there's, there's many studies out there, but one of the neat ones by Simon Davis and Francois Vola was when they were studying for the evidence of the domestic dog, they unearthed a 12,000-year-old Natufian tomb in northern Israel. And what they found was the skeleton of an adult hunter gatherer whose left hand was resting on the skeleton of a dog or a Middle Eastern wolf of approximately four to five months of age. And quoting their research, they say, this is proof that an affectionate rather than a gastronomic relationship existed between the animal and the person. All right, so that was 12,000 years ago. And now we continue to advance a little bit further in natural selection by artificial selection, whereby we molded dogs into new forms that enhanced their value to us. Welcome to domestication. And then it advanced a little bit further until finally we're at present day where many of these dogs 
have been turned into biological dolls or surrogate children. How many times do we hear in a week, Joshua and Kara, that I don't have real children. I have dog children. On a daily basis, multiple times a day. Yeah, it's probably the biggest struggle we deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And so what is the harm? I mean, what is the harm of thinking that you own a, a little child in a fur coat? Well, I think more than anything, it's the expectations that come with that. I had a client who asked me, Brian, if a dog's year, a year of age is the equivalent of a seven-year-old human, or I believe I got advice uh, backwards. The, if a dog is seven years old, when a human is one year old, then why can't my six month old dog be housebroken? Because my child at three, three and a half was potty trained. Again, I could, and we'll go over this in many, many episodes uh, to come that talk about the expectations that occur when we think we own a child in dog clothing. The, and people who think like that, by the way, they, they have a lot of reason to do so, not just from their own need, but also because the pet industry, which is a $70 billion a year money making machine, doesn't make that money trying to convince you that you own a domestic wolf. Instead, they want you to believe you have a little person in a fur coat. You have a child. And they know it works because why? We were imprinted when we were young to not like wolves, to think of wolves as the villain. In other words, give you a couple examples. Who tried to eat Little Red Riding Hood? Oh, I think it was a wolf. Who wanted to huff and puff and blow the house down and then devour the three little pigs? Yeah, I think it was another wolf. And I've heard of a werewolf, but I've yet to hear of a were-doodle. Maybe that'll be the new breed that will come along here soon. <laughs> I think that's what we call them, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we're, we're doodles indeed. Uh, even in the Bible, Jesus uses the wolf as a metaphor 13 times to describe evil and greed. In the Quran, who will surely devour Joseph? Oh, another wolf. And in Shakespeare's King Lear, Act 3, Scene 6, played by the part of the fool, he's mad that trust in the tameness of a wolf, a horse's health, a boy's love, or a whore's oath. And even in the movie The Grey, and by the way, I have not seen the movie in its entirety. Uh, people ask me all the time, have you seen The Grey? Uh, no, I go, no. And then they look completely surprised. Why have you not seen The Grey? Why? Why have I not seen The Grey? Why? Because it's a pretty simple storyline. A, it's oil workers uh, who crash on a plane while en route to their two-week vacation in the remote Alaskan wilderness, and they're hunted by wolves. There are more wolves than men. The men have rifles, but the wolves have lots and lots of time. And they're very patient creatures. And therefore, I guess I just didn't have all of that time. <laughs> <laughs> and the movie just never really struck my interest. But if you've seen it and you love it, hey, let us know. Uh, I, I promise if everyone out there votes and says, Brian, you've got to watch that movie. I will watch it and we'll talk about it on another episode. Uh, but back to one of the most harmful things in thinking that we, we own something quite different than, than what it really is. First of all, you don't respect the animal in, in doing so. You don't respect nature. And then you start placing demands on the creature that it just simply cannot meet. It cannot meet our expectations. Hence why 700,000 plus animals are euthanized every year for behavior. In other words, when you believe you own a child instead of a domestic wolf, you expect to behave like a child. And down the rabbit hole we go. 
this show is about convincing you that you don't have to think like that and still fall in love with your dog. You don't have to believe that your dog is a child to reach a compatibility, a, a level of happiness that you've never known before. You don't have to. It's fine to recognize them for what they are. Embrace the wild in your dog. Don't be afraid of it. But when we do believe in that, is it a wonder that problems associated with behavior is the number one reason why dogs are given up and put in shelters and then eventually some of you euthanized? Is it a wonder why half of the reported dog attacks and fatalities that occur are occur to children under the age of nine? Is it a wonder? I had a lady who came to see me with a three-year-old girl named Susie and a three-year-old Rottweiler named Rocky. Susie had nine staples in the side of her head because at one point, Rocky held Susie's Barbie doll in her mouth, in his mouth. Susie approached. Rocky warned he wanted to keep the Barbie doll. But Susie, being three years old, did not recognize the signals that were being sent to her by the Rottweiler. So she proceeded on, and she was eventually bitten by Rocky. The mother was, of course, devastated. And she asked me, Brian, why did this happen? Why? We got him when he was a little bitty puppy. When she was just a baby. So they would grow up together. And he would grow to be her big brother, her protector and her best friend. But yet he attacked her. Again, believing that you have a little person in a fur coat. Rocky didn't see Susie as his sister. He saw instead a mammal that was head level with him, which is known as the principle of resemblance. And as Susie approached him, he warned, because now she had taken on the shape of a competitor. She was an opponent. She wanted that doll and he wanted to keep it. It's known as competitive aggression. The number one reason for aggression on the planet earth among humans and dogs. And so when she reached and did not heed his warning, he attacked. And I had to go on to convince the mother and the father that Hey, that was the movie for you. She approached, he warned, she, she ignored, he attacked, she left, he kept Barbie. And unfortunately, that movie is going to play itself over and over again until you change your mindset. Now, guys, that was many, many years ago. Rocky has since passed from this earth. And that young girl is now grown and married. But that family got their act together. And they embraced the wild and their dog. And then they tamed the wild and their dog. And they got two other Rottweilers and they ended up having two other daughters as well. So that's what it means to tame the wild and your dog. To recognize the natural instinct. Because all behavior, the default mechanism is instinct. We recognize it for what it is. And then we nurture it. We deactivate the behaviors that are fine if you live in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, but they don't work for, well for me in, in my urban setting. We tame the wild in your dog. All right, guys, we're going to cut away again to another break. And again, you did a great job that first time. Sit, stay. When we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit more. We're going to tell you a couple more stories here, and we're going to be getting some insight from Joshua and Kira on clients and how they deal with their dogs. And then we're going to talk about you, what's going to happen on our next episode. So again, see you in a few minutes. All right. Perfect. Great job. All clear. Back in about two. Thank you. Good job. Your papers were all out of order. I had to straighten them up for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All you guys out there on Facebook live, that are watching this. Know this, I'll take any suggestions you have for these headphones because this thing is wearing a hole in the top <laughs> of my head. It reminds me of some of my Navy training, which we had to carry these little rubber boats on top of our heads. And I used to just have nightmares or just spend all my waking hours trying to come up with something to be on the top of they're my head. They're not very head. comfortable, are they? No, they're not. 
radio business is tough. You got to wear headphones that are not comfortable at all and then talk into this little tube here. But I hope we're doing a good job. Uh, I'm, I appreciate you guys tuning in and we will definitely uh, take any advice that you have, any recommendations, and we will be ready to go. This is the page you're on. Okay. Don't mess with the papers. <laughs> Got to have my wife there. Next time, I think if you just said this to me in a file, I just have it on my tablet so you don't hear this every time. Okay. No, you're good. Okay. You're all in order. Don't forget about Dr. Kelsey. I'm, trying, I'm right there. Right here, so get ready for that question there. <clears throat> All right, coming back here in about 10 seconds. Bring it. Internet Talk Radio, VoiceAmerica.com. You are listening to Taming the Wild and Your Dog. To reach the program today, please call 1-866-472-5788. Again, that's 1-866-472-5788. You can also send an email if you prefer to brian at tamingthewild.com. Now back to the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Taming the Wild and Your Dog. I hope the weather's good where you guys are. Uh, we we're just looking at the news a little bit ago, and it's our daughter goes to school up in Philadelphia, and it's uh, four degrees. That was going to be the low today. And what did you see? How what was the temperature in Chicago? Anyone in Chicago? Just send us something on Facebook or drop an email. Let us know how cold is it there today or in Ohio? How cold is it supposed to be, Joshua? Oh, I know. Cooper oh. said this morning. Okay, what was it? 40 below or something 40 ridiculous below. Okay. like that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I grew up in Alaska, and I'm here to tell you, we walked to school uphill both ways, of course, in about six feet of snow on a good day, and they didn't call class until it was at least 30 below zero. <laughs> so anyone looking in my direction here, I don't have too many sympathy violins going at this moment. We're actually sitting here, coming to you live from Memphis, Tennessee. This is uh, our weather today is not going to reach the freezing temperature. Yay. I am happy. I love wintertime. You get to do so many things in the wintertime that you can't do in the summertime. And one of the activities that I'm doing is called urban mushing. You guys out there that are listening and we're talking about dogs and dog behavior and dog nutrition and everything else. Well, know this. We don't get a get out of jail free card because I do this for a living. Neither does Joshua. We have to practice everything that we preach. And right now we have a seven month old Siberian Husky puppy. His name is Tikani. That's Alaskan uh, Indian for wolf. Uh, go figure. So that being said, it definitely has had its little moments uh, because and I, I'm sitting there thinking we already had three dogs. And our life was perfect. Oh my gosh, perfect. We have a cattle dog. He's much smarter than I am. We have two little Morkies. And if you don't know what those are, those are little Maltese Yorkie mixes and Kira calls them. The rats. The rats. If you ever hear mention that, by the way, they're not rodents. They're about the size of a rodent, but they're not actually little Morkies, little dogs. They're not rodents. But a lot of people stand back aghast as soon as she says that and goes, wow. You actually yeah, own rats. rats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we also own cats. Uh, we have a big Siamese named Frank, and he's about the size of a mountain lion. Therefore, the dogs back off and leave Frank along. But we also have a ragdoll cat named Ollie, who I guess we should have named Gandhi, because he <laughs> doesn't do anything. He is the most passive, resistant creature in the world. The dogs run up to him. They barely touch him with their nose, and he just tips over like a stuffed 
cat. And they lose interest very quickly. But Frank, oh, Frank Howell's ears go back, all those 10 switchblades he has in those two front paws. And now that is much, much, much fun. And the sport sets in. So if you guys have any dogs and cats, definitely write in any questions or just let me know because I may be asking you questions on how to deal with that. But that's our household. Wanted to kind of invite you in just a little bit here. We are dog people. We're not just dog professionals. We live and breathe dogs 365 days a year. But back to before the break, we were talking about keeping it real, keeping it real, understanding what dogs are, embracing that, not being afraid of that. It's awesome. Hey, do I put Elvis sunglasses on my dog on occasion? Of course I do. That's fun. And I live in Memphis. Have I shared any of my human food with dogs? Okay, um, I'm confessing right here on air. I have. I can't dare pick up French fries and have these eyeballs looking at me and drool over my shoulder while I'm driving. Yeah, I got to share. Welcome to loving dogs. Man, I, again, again, you, you hear my passion. We love it. We love what we do. But also part of my job is to make sure that we, we kind of keep our feet grounded, that we are always believing what is really real? Just because we believe it so doesn't make it so. We have to trust in nature. She's always correct. She's never wrong. And we must move down that course. So at all the upcoming episodes that we'll be sharing with you, any questions you ask me, don't be surprised if I move in the direction of nature. Because I always do. Keep it simple, stupid rule. Keeping it simple creates action. And I tell you what, I've always told people, I would rather you do something and just do it wrong at first, but at least you did something. Now we'll fix it if we can. But we're going to try and get you started off on the right foot and make sure you do it correct the first darn time and not the second time. Because again, it can lead into some problems uh, if you do do it incorrectly. So back to owning a little child in a fur coat. Kira, every day, you talk to dog owners and you're the first one. If people want to reach Brian, they have to go through Kira first and hence her nickname, the great and powerful Oz, because that's why she is. If I want to get back to Kansas and I've been clicking my heels for about 50 some odd years, Kira is the one that's to get me there. Kira is the great and powerful Oz. She's the first one to talk with clients and, 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 Every day, try to reassure them, give them advice, and also select who they really need to see. Do they need to come see Brian or do they need to see Josh or any of our other trainers? So, Kira, that being said, tell me a little bit about some of those phone calls, uh, especially the ones that in which they believe that it, it's a child that they own. Tell, tell us a little bit about that and some of the problems that, that you've encountered. Sure, sure. Well, I deal with people who are on opposite ends of the spectrum, really. There are some who have completely unrealistic expectations for their puppies and their dogs. They expect their puppy to be housebroken at 12 weeks, and they honestly think that their puppy is housebroken already at 12 weeks. And I, I feel bad telling them, oh, no, not yet, not yet, because they really do firmly believe it. And they also feel like their pup should be ready for off-leash obedience at around 12 weeks, 14 weeks, they don't understand why they have to wait. They're slow maturing mammals. You have to wait for things, be patient. But then on the opposite end of the spectrum, I talk to people who baby them so much. They baby these puppies. They carry them everywhere. They feel guilty when they put them in the crate. They don't want to use any kind of correction for them at all. Even a verbal, no, fooey, whatever, when they go potty in the house. They feel guilty when they're not giving the puppy undivided attention. So it's just, it's difficult to having to deal with all, all these different types of people who are calling in every day. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to the same thing. They all think that they're dealing with a child instead of a dog. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful though, when we're able to point out what it is that they really own and, and, and give them some good sound advice. It's almost like you hear air coming out of a balloon again. Dogs are supposed to bring us joy and you can achieve that. You just have to have the right advice. You have to 
behave properly around dogs. Now, Joshua, you have a real child, right? Young son. Correct. <clears throat> and you also have three dogs. And a cat. And a cat. <laughs> yeah, we have to have cats too, okay. Uh, is there any difference between how you treat your child and your dogs? How about you? Well, if you're asking me if I put my child in a crate in a dark room, um, yes, I just call it a crib to make myself feel better. <laughs> um, but um, absolutely, there's differences. Absolutely. Um, both dogs and children need rules and boundaries, but it's the way in which you apply those rules and boundaries that make all the difference. Um, I talk to my child. Um, I don't talk to my dogs because I just look like an idiot, um, you know, talking to a brick wall because they don't understand my language. I kind of use their language to communicate to them. But um, overall, um, the child is, is, I'm able to reason with the child. I'm not able to reason with, with the dogs. So absolutely, there's differences. Now at your child's age, Aaron, tell the listeners, how old is your child? Oh gosh, put me on the spot. Um, he'll be two in April. So how many months that is? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any math majors out there? Here we go. Um, one thing about that though is, and I used to always say, a young child at that age does operate very closely to a dog. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and I kind of had a discussion with my wife about him kind of really putting it to her when it go time to go to bed, he, you know, he really works her. She goes back in there and coaxes him and all this stuff. And I said, you know, give him two choices, an alternative, go to sleep with, with your little bear or, or go to sleep without your bear and see what happens. And we just simply applied similar techniques that we would with a dog. We, he would start crying and I would just go in there. I wouldn't say a word. I would just take the bear away and leave. And I'd come back in and he would stop crying. I'd give him that bear back and I'd leave. I never said a single word. And he figured out real quick, oh, I would much rather lay in here with the bear. So I'm not going to cry. And it worked like a charm. And now putting him to bed is, is like a, a two minute process. It's no longer a big ordeal like it used to be. So there are similarities, but you have to be careful where you apply those similarities. Yeah. You got to know where to draw the line, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, ha you have to know that there are many similars. Uh, we can be under humans and dogs are under the same umbrella, uh, if we title that umbrella as social predators. We are. We have many, many similarities. We grow up. We leave our pack. We, as we age, the right hemisphere of our brain, the little camera lens that allows you to identify threats, to know how to escape danger, that lens opens wider with each passing month for your dog and each passing year for humans. Why is it narrow when you're young? Because you're under the protective custody of your parents. It doesn't have to be wide open. But as we reach a certain age, typically young adulthood for humans 18 or, or older, we're now ready to leave. At least ours did. We rehomed them at that point. We rehomed them to you. We did, didn't we? <laughs> She's <laughs> we, pretty happy too. We did. So there's many, many similarities. And, and in upcoming shows, we will be discussing those similarities. Uh, and, and I think you'll find it very, very enlightening. All right, we're getting ready to, to draw an end to this very first show. I want to talk to you a little bit about next week. We're going to have a guest here. And that guest is Dr. Carr Kelsey, an incredible man, incredible veterinarian. A couple of unique things about Carr. One, his medical facility only treats dogs, dogs only. So I want to get him in here and talk to him. Why did he make that decision? And number two, he happens to be a bit of an expert about canine influenza or canine cough. And guys, I hate to say it, but it's that time of the year, not just for humans, but it's time of the year in which we start, our dogs start to have colds. Now, if you're one of those dog owners who sends your, all, your dog off to a boarding facility or a daycare, and it comes back coughing and wheezing, and you blame that facility and or that daycare for its uncleanliness because, of course, the dog went in healthy and then it came out sick. So it has to be the fault, and now all the blame goes there. Well, if you're one of those or you're a little apprehensive about maybe boarding your dog, spring break is coming up here soon, and then the summer vacation, you'll definitely want to tune in here as we talk to Dr. Kelsey about canine cough and also is the new CIV vaccine that's been out for about a year and a half, is it necessary 
Should our dogs have that vac vaccination? Also, be ready to send in any questions that you have to ask, that you want to ask a veterinarian, but you just didn't come up with it when you're in that tiny little bitty exam room and you only had 10 minutes and they were prodding your dog and putting needles in his butt and so on and so forth. So again, we're going to have him in here with us, Dr. Carl Kelsey from Kelsey K9. I'm really excited about that. Guys, this week, come up with your questions. Come up with a story. On the end of every show, I want to share a good story. I want to share a story about what dogs have done for you. If you, I will be sharing some personal moments about what dogs have done for me, the therapy that they've given me. And I want you to do the same thing. I want to end on a good note. Or send those in. You can email those in. You can phone it in next week. And again, that number is 866-472-5788. Or send them in to brian at tamingthewild.com. Uh, next week, we're going to have a lot of fun. We've got a lot of questions to answer. Many of those have already come in. Send yours in. We're going to be talking to Dr. Kelsey. For the rest of this week, guys, have a wonderful week. Be safe. Watch out for frostbite. It's nasty. Been there, done that. You don't want to do, go there. So be in now and then turn around if you can. Give that dog of yours a hug for me. All right. We'll catch you guys next week here on Taming the Wild and your dog. I'm Brian Bailey. I'm your host. And I want to thank Kara for coming in today and sharing this with me. And also, Josh, I appreciate uh, your input today on today's show. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, have a great week. We'll see you. You're free. You no longer have to sit and stay. See you next week. And we're all clear. Nicely done. Good show. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right. And so I'll have this up for archive play, uh, probably about uh, another hour or so. And um, yeah, it should be good. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day and we'll talk to you next time. All right. All you guys out there on Facebook live. Thanks for tuning in. Love having you here. Um, we will uh, be doing some special Facebook live events like we used to do. Uh, we were just really focusing this week on getting ready for the radio show. So again, I appreciate uh, your support. Appreciate you watching. And as, as always, if you have questions, send them in here. We want to be able to answer those questions. We're going to have a lot of fun on this show. I know I had fun today. Uh, a little learning curve to it. There's a few panicky moments there. <laughs> where I'm going, oh my God, times. what happened to my webinar? It disappeared. <laughs> and I could have sworn I turned off my text messages, but I keep getting one about some package being delivered. <laughs> Crazy stuff. And then of course I'm getting all hot and bothered and, but I hope I kept my cool and hope you guys, uh, Oh, man, I didn't even know that was happening with Brian. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for tuning in. We're going to click off out of here and go get some lunch and relax a little bit and get ready for next week's show. Love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.